Welcome to Neuro Noodles, Neurofeedback, the Neuropsychology Podcast featuring tech legend Jay Gunkelman. He is the man who has read well over a half a million brain scans. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. The Neuro Noodle Podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you. MindMedia.com. Get the latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from MindMedia.com. Their semi-dry sensor cap is a wonder to see, and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. Their neurofeedback and QEEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit MindMedia.com now. Hey, Evie and Gordon. How are you, Pete? We're fantastic. Jay, there you are. Goodness <laughs> gracious. <laughs> what a pleasant surprise. You're looking well, Evie. Uh, oh, don't you. even say it about me. If you say I look well, I know you're lying. You know? <laughs> oh, you, 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 you're, 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 your energy is the same, dude. It's all there. I can feel it. <laughs> uh, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I still have plenty of that, so. Look yeah. at the smile you put on Jay's face, Evie. And how do you guys know each other? Oh, Jay, how man. do you know? How, how do you know Evie and Jay? Well, we go back to uh, early uh, brain resource company days, and uh, uh, Evian and Martine and uh, Cameron Fallopour and uh, the the brain resource company. Um, and then I published my. Uh, paper in 2005, and uh, Evian made these outrageous statements about my paper <laughs> that it was actually quite good. <laughs> uh, uh, but we've we've been uh, friends uh, for uh, uh, an embarrassingly long number of years, almost. Jay is uh, one of the you know brain warriors that was there when we were all in our most masochistic phase, where we. We were, you know, all trying in our own little ways to um, to bring the pieces together, Pete. And um, and Jay was kind of one of the mentors for everybody about thinking, you know, just his thoughtfulness about EGs and his um, just his kind of ability to kind of really bring the pieces together for real was just you know, kind of inspiring for all of us. So he was um, he was part of the you know the band of warriors and still is, you know, frankly. But uh, yes, yeah, so, and, and how do you guys know each other, Pete? We've been trying to spread the word for quite a while in neurofeedback, you know, and uh, we've went from uh, one listener, one subscriber to 30,000, and we're just, you know, one click at a time. You know, we're trying to get everybody on the same page because Jay's been working on this since 72, and uh, yeah. we, there's so much good that we can do out there, so we... We, and I'm trying to squeeze every little bit of knowledge out of Jay's brain so I can put it into some AI somewhere so I can have a bunch <laughs> of Jay Gunkelman robots. Yeah, good luck on that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I was a guest on Pete's uh, uh, podcast, and uh, he had two uh, uh, staff people that were commentators on it, like I am now. And uh, I'm such a blabbermouth that I chased them both off. Uh, they, they asked me. They asked me to come on the show uh, and and you know uh, uh, interact with the guests and you know me and Evie and we've had a bunch of co-hosts on there, starting with my sister. She's a neuropsychologist. She had friends that are psychologists, and anybody that can come on, you know, to to get to put a different voice out there to help somebody. That's you know what we're trying to do. I facilitate, and I'm trying to put it. At, in a format will that people will consume in little bits and pieces or, or or a big chunk at a time. Jay has been singing praises about you. You have it all going. You, I aspire to have your content, Evian. Congrats! How, how did you get into it? No, thank you. Look, it's it's a it's a very simple story, really. My my background was in the heart, was in serum lipids and medicine. I came across. Um, Actually, she's here somewhere. Um, yeah, this I came across the woman who changed my life, which is uh, Mrs. Place, the the missing link fossil, you know, Ple Australopithecus, and and I was in the middle of finishing my PhD in the heart, and and my PhD supervisor who looked after the fossils showed me Mrs. Place's obviously a copy, and uh, there was her foramen magnum at the back of the brain, and which meant that she was bipedal, and I went, hold on a second. 
I'm going to be studying the heart for the rest of my life and our brains have trebled in size in the last sort of five million years. I think that's where I've got to be. So I had a conversion at the Mount there, uh, you know, Pete, uh, as I was finishing my PhD. And and then by luck, I got to be the head of a brain institute in the largest hospital in the Southern Hemisphere, Westmead Hospital in Sydney, before I immigrated to um, to the United States. And um, they just backed me to bring people together across disciplines to standardize and set up um, the first international database on the human brain. And I had enormous help from people like Stephen Kozlow, who's now unfortunately passed away uh, relatively recently, but he was the inaugural head of the Human Brain Project in Washington. And I realized that just nobody had standardized the data. And so we just standardized the data and uh, brought it all together. And people like Martin was a young, he was a young tadpole and he came and spent six months in our institute and he became a rock star. You know, he, people like him filtered through, got the bug of bringing the pieces together. He got, you know, he bought a couple of our standardized laboratories and then did the most remarkable things in, in neurofeedback. And there were many people like Martin who filtered through and then he introduced us to Jay and Cameron Fallopar in New York had a lab, and we were we were like a merry band of uh, of uh, it was like uh, it was it was just it was crazy days, man. It was fantastic, and um, I'm now just turned uh, you know seventy, Pete. So I'm thinking back now about the lessons that I've learned, and yeah, appreciate speaking to you guys to you know just share the little that I've learned, and from many 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 people, and some of the some of the main influences in neuroscience were interested in in sort of putting their, their wisdoms into this kind of network because we had this first standardized international database. So most of these things, people are just, you know, I'm just a conduit for aggregating some of these insights and approaches from many, many people, you know, Walter Freeman, Stephen Koslow, some of the actually, you know, some of the real heavyweights of, of the founders of neuroscience, basically, as we know it today. And so I just, it was kind of just pure luck. And, but my main luck was, 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 was meeting Mrs. Players because it gave me that context that what is more interesting, what is more deep fun than trying to put together the pieces of the brain. And finally, Pete, let me say, and this is a part where Jay had just helped us all really appreciate the dynamics that neurofeedback and EEG provide. And to this day, Pete, you know, I'm still shocked at how hard it is to get neurofeedback and EEGs out there on scale because it is the best time resolution signal we have. And I'm basically aggregated at all and there's no question and now with eegs coupled with genetics and and of course with with um with biofeedback signals like hrv which i you know monitor constantly it's a marvelous opportunity to finally jay you know converge real realistically now on scale things we just kind of arm waved about uh, you know all those years ago so that's that's the sort of yeah. my snapshot story pete what what's how do we get organized? Well, I'll tell you the story that I found, Pete, when I was appointed the head of this institute at Westmead Hospital. I had the funding and the people to all come together into the same room. You know, engineers, psychologists, psychiatrists, neurologists, and it was shocking how dismal it was. People were just point scoring and talking past each other, and I suppose. I was ready to go back to cardiology. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> and then one morning I got woken up at 3 a.m., Pete, and I went, what's missing? What am I missing? Am I just suck at this? And I went, yeah, you probably do. But putting that to one side, what else am I missing other than my own flaws? And it was data. And I realized standardized data. So I pulled my friend Steve Koslow, who was given $100 million from NIH after the Genome Project, to set up databases of the brain across the United States and Europe. The, the Blue Brain Project comes out of, partially out of his funding initially. A lot of people, a lot of Nobel Prize laureates got funding from him. I said to him, Steve, how many of your collaborators, of your people you funded, collaborate? And you can imagine the answer, Pete. Yeah. Zero. Right. And I went, okay, this is not right. So we standardize. And we therefore allow a sharing of data. So what I did is we standardized 
the database. And then each group got the same data set. And we said, okay, let's see what the physicists can do with the, you know, they big picture thinkers. And guess what? Cut a long story short with a little bit of help from Roger Sperry, the Nobel Prize laureate, and his PhD student who became a friend of mine, Jim Wright, and a marvelous team of physicists at Sydney University, Peter Robinson, Chris Rennie. They simulated EEGs for real, man, with, you know, differential equations. And Jane knows this. Most people don't read their papers. Seriously, people, we have the most powerful EEG simulation on the planet going that can help elucidate the dynamics beyond just simplistic kind of FFTs, real-time EEG dynamics by physicists. Mathematicians, of course, came up with these marvelous new new methodologies. And we started to see that the psychologists came up with different models and the psychiatrists and everybody started to share their insights, Pete, because they had something in common now, data. So that to me is still remains the, the, the learning. My 70-year-old brain now looks back and goes, why is it so hard for neurofeedback people to organize themselves? to standardize or use a data set standardized. And I have to be honest with you, and Jay knows this story. I mean, I deal with a lot of groups. Neurofeedback and EG people are the most difficult. They're the most territorial. They, I mean, it's all, you know, academia is tough to converge with now the corporate. To me, that's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's about finding, I used to say the coalition of the willing. No, it's the coalition of the aligned. Willing is not enough. They've got to be people who, for whatever reason, know how to work together and share data in a way that is synergistic. It's not hard, Pete, I tell you. The biofeedback people did it. I mean, we collaborate with, you know, the great uh, Dick Gewurz, Julian, Julian, uh, Julian, and uh, Julian, uh, sorry? Fair. Yeah, Julian Thayer and, um, and, um, and, um, and other people from biofeedback. And they're marvelous. I mean, they're just incredibly contagious and re self-reflective and magnanimous, I would say, in the way that they they share their insights and, and, and publish. And, but I haven't found that same spirit of collaboration for, I don't know what it is in, in EEG. I found in psychiatry, psychology, of course, there are, there are major battles that occur sometimes. And I, we try to just harvest the data and the coalition of the willing. So I think, you know, we, we, are, we bear a lot of scars, Pete, from, from failed efforts at doing that. But we also have many sharings that I think we could help to, to, to basically make that happen. There's no reason that it shouldn't, Pete, none, none whatsoever. D Dr. Gordon, do you think it should be regulated? Meaning no. a gov government regulated, so that means that you have to have a, a license to to practice neurofeedback and use EEG. It makes sense for sure, for sure. I mean, like, but you know, regulation comes, and please call me Evian. You know, Pete, regulation comes at a cost because clearly there's got to be some bar of educational and standardized methodology. Um, and, and you know, neurofeedback is now a very evolved field. So I think in that sense, yes, but I think it would be helpful for government to get a little more involved in reimbursement. Look at how much neurofeedback people struggle to get reimbursed. And it's crazy um, because, you know, somebody who, and, you know, this is where these marvelous uh, other brain warriors who helped, for example, get the Mental Health Parity Act across the line, you know, yeah. Henry Harbin, who's very interested in neurofeedback. He's, he's a remarkable man. And, and he pushes neurofeedback all the time. And he got Tom Insel to fund a neurofeedback project, unfortunately. And great kudos to, to Tom for doing that study. But, uh, you know, um, the, the, the study was about comparing neurofeedback to a placebo. Like, seriously, people, there's 17 studies that have been going around in circles on that. Do a comparative effectiveness study. There are ways of doing this as applied integrative neuroscientists where you just need people with a slightly different lens than the usual silos. And we're talking about the whole brain as a system. You know, you bring in the physicists, you bring in the mathematicians, and you, you basically look at comparative, you know, you look at multiple ways of looking at the data. If you, if you pigeonhole it like a placebo study, 
Man, you're going to write. It's yeah. hard to find a placebo in behavior change. Sorry, uh, this is basic one-on-one stuff. And and, uh, and, it's, uh, and not even it's not even ethical to do a placebo-based study when there's known treatments for oh, a disorder. Yeah, absolutely. And the but, other, you know, uh, exactly. And so you start with the comparative yeah. effectiveness. You then have a spin-off to look for plus sure. But you know that even I deal with the FDA now for tests that we have the first tests to predict treatment remission in psychiatry, and they are not. Hung up. I mean, they go comparative effectiveness is a very powerful way to go. And this is from the FDA. People, things have changed. People are beginning to address the complexity of the brain in non simplistic terms. And you just need the right people there, Pete. That's all it comes down to, you know? You know, put Jay in the front line, man, it'll happen. Well, I'm, I'm, every week I'm trying to get him out there, whatever we can get. But put it's, you in the uh, front line. The, 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 but, the, but the paths will you know, the paths will become obvious. But you know, I, I'm just the MBA of the group. I'm the mom is mom and dads that are out there, and they just I want my kid fixed. And I'm hearing that this database is the way to go. This database, my treatment is this. We have fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You have a marketing problem out there. You have an organizational problem. And look, everybody's in this to make a buck. They spent fifteen to twenty five thousand dollars for their equipment. They're trying to get it paid off. And you have people that aren't really business people going out there trying to market, you know, what they're doing. And then you have the moms and dads who are like, I don't know what to do. Just give me a pill. Yeah. So so this is not a regulation issue. This is a field issue. So uh, if I may just share one example with you, I mean, yeah. I'm just the observer to the field. I'm not near, my knowledge of neurofeedback is not even in the same league as the Jay Gunkelmans now and the Martin, Martins and the Camerons and the many other experts out there. But I am an observer of the patterns that matter. And so here's my, my take on because I get a lot of requests from people to say, should I do neurofeedback on my kid? I go, hell yeah. But, but start off with to take ADHD, which is the most common question I get about neurofeedback. Um, should my kid do neurofeedback? I go, yeah. So they go to some neurofeedback practitioner who's you know, sucked into the triumph of marketing over substance, promise the world without any context about where's the real solid signal. Now, Jay, please correct me or expand and help me understand my knowledge better. But I, I am super clear in my mind from the data that just even if you just start with, you know, sensory motor rhythm training and personalized down training of theta where it exists, which in our database, Pete, I've scored the database myself. And I can see that about, We've had 24 publications in ADHD from the database, and I can see that in about 60% of kids have, have increased, the kids, the younger kids, not the adolescents, have an increase in theta. So when you take a Jay Gunkelman's approach to personalize, get the, get the, and you downtrain theta properly, and I think sensory motor rhythm with respect to sleep spindles, I'm very interested in the baroreceptor reflex because of its link to biofeedback. And, you know, this brilliant stuff that Dick and Julian and Paul Lira have focused on, which is resonant, six breath per minute, resonant breathing and personalization of that. So you bring together some biofeedback and some neurofeedback, simple, clear, two things in my mind, three things, sorry, resonant breathing, six breath per minute to get the person calm with biofeedback training. And you just, the, the, the biofeedback industry easy to tap into and very powerful. Converge that with some, you know, um, basically sensory motor rhythm and down training of theta. And there's, in my personal view, Jay, there's nothing contentious about that. And I could, I could offer that to any, I do suggest that to every parent or group or organization that asks me, and that should be reimbursed. Now, am I wrong in that, Jay? Or tell me what I'm missing. Uh, you're going to end up with 90 plus percent of, of people fitting that model without any trouble. Uh, without a good look at the EEG, uh, uh, on rare occasion, you may end up having uh, uh, a, a bit of a, a difficulty with an outcome. But, um, but uh, neurofeedback practitioners uh, at this point, compared to the you know, 20 years ago, uh, are looking at the EEG ahead of time. Uh, the, 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 it's a rarity for them at this point not to be. Uh, it used to be the commonality uh, that it was symptom-driven protocols. You had 
this complaint, so you got this protocol. Uh, now there's a lot of people that are uh, looking at the EG as uh, uh, to for, give them some guidance as to uh, what to train and where and how. And I, I think with that personalization, uh, you, you get a little better than the the, the, the usual 80-20 that, that the people tend to report early on yeah. in the so, field. So, so just to make my point clear, Pete, that I'm not at all suggesting not to do the personalization. I'm saying that the personalization, I think, adds to the credibility. It adds to the very important issues that Jay and Martin and others have shown, for example, beta spindles on the one hand. You know, they're, they're, they're things you've got to be cautious about, so you want that clarity. And so, I, and then, of course, the, even if it's not 90%, if it's 80%, there's some people who wouldn't respond to drown training. Yeah. And of course, with kids with ADHD, 20% of them are going to have a high anxiety issue. So you need to resolve that issue pretty clearly. However, um, all I'm saying though, Pete, is that if my basic premise of signal is correct, that SMR and down training theta is a solid and unquestionable converging evidence starting point why would we you not bring in you know Henry Harbin and all the other heavyweights in Washington to help get this thing reimbursed and then have a tight control or tighter control over what neurofeedback practitioners do and say? And so they can't just go around triumph, you know, overstate, you know, over over marketing and 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 promising the world when clearly you're sitting with gold and massive signal. And um, but then there are other parts, of course, and other methodologies that are that are really important. But I'm just saying, there's a, in my view, there's a context problem where the signal is not greater than the noise. And I'll just come back to my example with biofeedback, where resonant breathing biofeedback, the data strong, the physiology is strong. We can elucidate the underlying baroreceptor reflex for controlling blood pressure. They're now looking at the afferent and efferent pathways. Now we can start looking at the genetics and the personalization. And you can see that it's starting to get very powerful because they they basically found the signal and they're not looking, not looking at other signals. They're looking at other signals. Heart rate variability is a very complex signal. There's micro changes that they can move to next, but they 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 landed on it. Now, if you go to the 22,000 publications on HRV, how many do you think they're going to be on resonant breathing, six breaths per minute, HRV biofeedback training? You want to have a guess, Pete? How many out of those 22,000 papers are about that? <laughs> no, there's like 30, 40, Pete, you know, oh, Pete converts. But three, who, 30. No, there's there's, 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 a, there's, there's a, do, a couple of dozen. Now, that's the problem, that... Why isn't that organized better so that people can get to the signal and test it with better? Well, with better well it, might, it might as well be zero. But and then, Jay, you, you're, you're getting polite in your young age now. So you, you, you <laughs> pop in, you know, whatever. But show me the data. Like if I go to talk to a congressman right now and say, hey, why aren't we introducing at least breathing in, in schools for kids? Start them young so they know how to deal with stress. Well, I need to see the data. I need to see the published reports. Uh, why not introduce neurofeedback to school counselors? Well, I need to see the data. And then the the N comes up. I'm like, how much data, how much How much do you need? And I, I just, I know you guys have been fighting for this for a long time. I've only been doing this maybe five years, Evian. But I'm just looking at it. I'm like, I see the people are, they started out here and they got better Okay, that's a, the end that I need to see. Jay's published papers. You publish papers. There's pa Thatcher has papers. Every has everybody has papers. The stack is this high. What is it going to take for the government and the insurances to say, you know what, we need to pay the same for physical harm as, as and, and mental harm? Yeah, well, it's it's a law now, so it's not a matter of what does it say. It's actually the law. So the thanks to. Henry Harbin and the, the, the Kennedy Foundation, that it is mental health parity's law. And so as long as you can show equivalence of evidence to a medical condition, yeah, my understanding is that, you know, that group will go in and fight for you to get it reimbursed. And I, I still do not understand why that's not happening in a targeted way. I mean, am I allowed, can I share my screen to give you one example? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good to go. Go ahead. So if you just 
to, I mean, these are just a couple of slides, but just yeah, to yeah, take an example, of, I'm just going to give an example here from um, the data from, from our particular database, but it, there's lots of other examples. So you take our database, this is a heat map of data in ADHD with just, you know, a couple of kids, 345. And when you look at the stratified evidence, you can see you can detect the subgroup of kids that'll be, that'll be all, that are basically you know, high anxiety kids who you've got to be careful to put these kids on, on stimulants, they're high anxiety, versus the others, the, 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 the high theta kids, the, the, the theta beta. All I'm saying is there's data like this, Pete, that's around where you combine this with all the other databases, the New York database, the other databases that are out there. It's not a big exercise. It's simply yeah. a matter of convergent data. Now, you also go to a thing like this, study that we did in depression, the first study to predict treatment remission in depression. You look at all the EEG data. Martin's published stuff on alpha frequency for predicting treatment remission. There's publications using the ERPs on that for treatment prediction. There's data using Loretta, EEG Loretta for predicting treatment remission. So why, it's not, it doesn't take a lot. I mean, we've got 55 publications from this data set. So you can see the relationship between them um, and uh, and 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 all these these other groups. It's it's not that complicated. It's a matter of integrating the signal and having a few of the right people, the, the hardcore warriors at the front end, getting a dream burst. Uh, it's it's not a mystery. It's just a matter of not overstating and focusing yeah. on the signal that is replicated and bringing in Henry Harbin. And putting Jay yeah. at the front line. I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, Pete, I'm shocked that it hasn't happened yet. I'll make a phone call. I mean, who who are the uh, frontline warriors? I got Jay. I've been pressing it's Henry Harbin and Jay. That's all. Henry and, Harbin, Jay, and you and you just calm down the other competitive people like <laughs> me and the yeah. other databases and say, go back into your box. Give us the evidence that you have in a non-competitive way, in a synergistic way, so that. The people who know how to get this re reimbursed, like Henry Harbin and Jay, get it done. If if we go open source, guys, doesn't that make the pie bigger? So maybe you lose out your propri proprietary. You don't have identifiers on it, but you make the pie larger. You have a one, one deposit to put everything. Have, at, at each EEG that's done, it goes here, here are the symptoms. Don't you think that would kind of there's your ends growing after each scan, right? Or no? I I I I think that's really critical. You know, Jay, what Pete's saying. Yes, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of strange, as I say, strange. Uh, look, people are self-serving and competitive. That's just the capitalism. Nature of I get it. So, however, people are not stupid. So yeah. if we were able to share data or look at data, but with this caveat, you see already I've seen what people, some people have said about our database, you know, people love to pull the wings of butterflies. It's what people do when, they, when they're insecure. When you're insecure, what you do is you find a way, some sort of flaw in the hope diamond that you then go and bullshit about. Yeah. The, the the convergent, it's just EEG data, for God's sake. The yeah. convergent data is readily easy to see a very simple metric. What replicates? It's not, com it's not, com it's not complicated. So it's a matter of sharing. What did the Total Brain International, Brain Resource International database find? What did the New York database find? What is convergent? Not what is different or why their database is better than our database or vice versa, simply what replicates. And then it removes the, 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 and, you know, we're talking about very good scientists who are good at seeing problems and flaws. And EGs is a complicated signal. And sometimes the amplifiers and the filtering and the way it's analyzed and the EMG correction and the e EOG correction can get people riled up. And I get that. And it is, it is a signal that lends itself to becoming riled up because small differences can actually distort the signal a bit. So quality control is critical, which is why we standardized the data across all the labs that used our, our, our systems. Um, but anyway, the point that I'm saying, Pete, is that sharing validated outcomes even 
if not data, is a very straightforward thing to do. Then there's a benefit for everybody to do that. Anyway, that's my my little 70-year-old, old, I'm emphasizing the word old, 70-year-old, been to this radio too many times, and it's happening in all the other fields, genomics, biofeedback, um, you know, CBT, well, it's had mindfulness meditation, like mind-blowing scale, because they stuck to their knitting. They just kept it simple. Uh, Evie, and if you want to see Jay get pissed, just watch. <laughs> Artificial <laughs> intelligence. <laughs> yeah. You, you have Dolly out there. You have Discord servers. You have, uh, make me a picture of Jay Gunkelman wearing a red hat, riding a uh, bison in North Dakota. Yeah, and it that. won't come out exactly right the first yeah, time, yeah. but after I do a, about 10 or 20 iterations, it'll finally come out. They you found that me? old picture, did they? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the way graphics are, I look, I can't read an EEG. I pay the best people in the world to read them for me. But if you have a, a pattern and you recognize it and you label it, if people don't share databases, I think this open source stuff is going to catch up some people and they're going to make their proprietary databases, I don't want to say worthless, but as the end gets bigger on the on the open side, I, I think this is going to really drastically uh, affect some of the people that are hoarding their information right now. Has artificial intelligence uh, come come your way yet, Evian? Oh God, yeah. So even with EEGs, you know, we've been looking at um, at this for a while. We looking, as I said, with the physicists involved, they opened up our our, our understanding of what could be modeled in a very deep kind of way in terms of literally simulating the first engine of the brain as an, you know, from, with respect to EEG dynamics. And then of course, as, as AI came in, we started to apply it to our eye spot data, for example. So we have groups on, you know, been working on this for quite a few years now, and the, the benefits are, are starting to pay off because it's big data, it's standardized. And so, yeah, it's, it's come our way, but you know, whether it's neurofeedback or any other field, I do not discount the input of the expert systems, like people, and I mean people like Jay. So you take somebody like his learning since 1972, I think it's been Jay. Is that correct? Yeah, that's when I so started. You look at yes. his, you look at his over a half a million brain scans, right? At well, there minimum we go. So half a million. You, but you look at his ability to spot patterns that matter in the brain, and you combine that with what are the strengths and limitations of AI because it's early days, there's marvelous new patterns, but Jay knows where the old patterns are. That combination, I think, is what the crucial kind of way forward is for the foreseeable future. And, uh, and that's what I see in every field we deal with, whether it's neurofeedback, genomics even, anything. There are patterns that matter that the expert systems, you know, they're like, they're like, you know, grandmaster chess players, they they know stuff that is, okay, chess is a bad example because you can literally do better than right. a brain. But you can't do that in the brain because of the dynamical complexities and the framework of how the brain works as a system. And, and lastly, um, you know, Pete, and by no means least, the fact and this weird reality that we were one of the labs to first show that our non-conscious brains are providing us snapshots in a fifth of a second, a fifth of a second, as to what is threatening and what is rewarding to us. So we have this whole non-conscious, what we call emotions and intuition, that is not so easy to be lucid aid. You know, we of course we all love rational data and rational logic, but until you have harmonized our brains, emotions, and intuitions with our rational thinking, you are walking around in the dark. And so that is not such an easy context for AI to simply come in and kick the door down. Well, Jay didn't get as upset as I thought he would be. So that's a good... That's a, that's <laughs> give me your story, better. Jay. Give me the, give me the full throat. Give the full throat. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm fine with uh, AI. Uh, it, it's just that it's got such a long ways to go before it masters the EEG. Um, uh, 
and uh, people have actually asked AI uh, what it would take for AI to master the EEG, and it, it gave a rational explanation that was going to take multiple years with experts and you know uh, in AI and experts in EEG and collaboration and masses of data. And, um, and I'm thinking it took me about five hundred thousand. You know, I mean, it, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if that's the kind of a data set size that they're going to need in order to be able to scrub it and, and extract uh, uh, patterns you know, readily from it. Um, yeah. You know, that's so true, Jane. I would love to urge you guys to invite um, <clears throat> uh, Jim Wright, who did his PhD with Roger Sperry and started the brain simulation of EEGs and Peter Robinson, the professor of physics at University of Sydney, and Chris Rennie, if you could get him, he's uh, he's hard to get. He's the guy that really not really with a warm up. email from you, Evian. Well, well, he's hard. <laughs> these, these guys are tough. He, Chris Rennie was the guy who the physicist I worked with in the Brain Institute who really set this up. But all three of them are masters at uh, EEGs, and I think you would find their views from a physicist's and Jim's also a psychiatrist, and Chris is a mathematician and computer scientist. Their views and Peter Robinson's findings, you know, he had like two dozen physicists at the end working on the EGs, and, and they, I really think if you could bring them into the discussion, um, you'll see why. You have this example of Jay, and he's, you know, 500,000 right. scans, and then you have the physicists and then the mathematicians, and you can see why very quickly that the expert systems are going to still have an enormous shaping of neurofeedback for, you know, for the next decade still, in my yeah. view anyway, from what I can see. Well, the, the, the key is, I think, data sets. It would be kind of nice if we knew somebody who wrote a book with that has about a million, a million and a half in them. Do you know of anybody, Evian, uh, the brain from knowing to doing? <laughs> Yeah, that was a charming little exercise. Let me tell you, I, I hit 70 and I went, oh, God, I better just put this down somewhere and share my, <laughs> share the bottom line learnings. It was, a, it was quite an exercise. I got it out on my 70th birthday last year. It was, it was fun. Uh, tell us about Wet Our Whistle. Let's sell some books here. Well, that's fine. But, I mean, basically it was, where is it? It's um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a simplification of everything I've learned of the brain from knowing to doing, and essentially it's it. I've tried to distill the learnings, pay it forward a little bit, I suppose, of all the magnanimous people over four decades, basically, yeah. and the database insight. And I suppose it comes down to three things. I think Pete, the one is that thing I started off saying that why should you care about how your brain works? And I suppose what I'm hoping to to do is say, well, because it empowers every aspect of what you do, whatever doorway you come through, whether it's a spiritual doorway or a brain science doorway or a psilocybin brain activation doorway or a Eckhart Tolle be here now and meditation doorway. What I think we've seen is that having a framework of how the basis of your brain works, especially this emotion, intuition, and rational harmonization, that literally, I think if you do not have a framework, or if you do have a framework, and you harmonize that a bit, it will empower every aspect of what you do, whatever doorway you come through. And that includes neurofeedback a lot, because you will, as you do neurofeedback, you will have such a deeper appreciation of how these tiny steps that you're training in terms of realigning and rewiring the neural networks that are a little bit out of kilter that Jay's mapping and insights will pinpoint that you have enormous implications to the dynamical consequences and sequelae by that little bit of alignment and coherence that you achieve. And so the first part of that book is just a simple framework of the brain so that people can get that deeper appreciation and befriend their brain better the second part, Pete, is habits. Like the science of habit is, you know, long is old, and there's still, you know, I work also with the American uh, Heart Association and the American Institute of Stress, and we, I see a lot of should lists, you know, what people should do, and and then these these marvelous 
researchers in the habit, science of habit, but, but most people don't really develop a good plan about how they're going to change their habits. You know, so all I do is I summarize the science of habit into a very simple three-step plan that, you know, you've got to start off by making sure you're ready to change and start with the end in mind. And then you've got to really understand, you know, what you're going to do rather than what you're told you should do and motivational interviewing and how you do it in really, really small steps and how you, you can really, you know, structure the, the way you train your daily habits and make it fun and give yourself self rewards. Of, and then of course, Tracking. If you don't, if you don't manage, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And then I, that's where I look at, you know, HRV and just micro tracking every little success. So you get a bit of a dopamine hit. Mm -hmm. So that's essentially, you know, what the story. Yeah, there we go. And or and, and, and sleep rings. Yeah, and that's essentially it, Pete. It's more like a distillation of a framework about the brain and how to choose yourself in a kind of systematic way. D Dr. Arvian Gordon. What is neurofeedback? Well, to me, neurofeedback is basically like rewiring the neural networks that are slightly out of time and bringing them back into coherence and into the appropriate timing that makes you work more effectively, your brain work more effectively. So for and it's the doing that with real-time feedback, which is the only way that the brain really works effectively is and and ben, and improves is real time feedback that's why continuous hrv works so well it's continuous real time feedback so that's all it is to me i mean i can use these fancy words in offering condition no, no yeah. it's just simply feedback that rewires the brain in a way that is personalized and puts your brain into the synchronization that works most effectively for you do you remember uh defrag with your laptop is that what it is? <laughs> defragmentation. Yeah, <laughs> defragmentation. Yes, the brain. You know, the disc is spinning. Yeah, it's looking yeah, for yeah. the information and putting. Yeah. You know, because I'm trying to explain it to people what it is, and if you explain anything for more than two sentences, you know, people are like trailing. Yeah, no, I, 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 I have to be honest with you. What I often say to people who don't even want that level of explanation, yeah. I say it's just magnifying what works. It's magnifying what works by tuning in what's not working, just magnifies what is working, and that'll yeah. serve you best. That's my that's my layest definition that I use when I persuade and nudge people to go and do neurofeedback. Yeah, it's a driver's training course for the brain. I mean, we it's not like we came with a, an owner's manual that tells us how to operate this damn thing, you know. And it, and uh, it is autonomic. So according to most people's traditional learning, it's beyond our control anyway. Uh, yeah. But then that was a, 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 an error. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it, it's, it's, it's not uh, totally beyond our control. In fact, who else is going to be controlling it? Exactly. You know? And you know, the other thing, Pete and Jay, that I do emphasize to people is that having studied the brain immersively you know, for 40 years now plus, uh, it really is striking to me that whilst I love all the detailed and magnificent architecture of the brain and the hotspots that people ascribe to various things, it is a timing device. Above all, it's about timing. And so when you go to neurofeedback, you're just sharpening the timing of what matters. And that, that simple word, Pete, you know, timing, is not usually what people hear because they often hear, you know, words that are more descriptive about, you know, words do not get to, timing gets to the physiology, the way the brain really is happening. And so that's off, also turned on some people, got them across the line that, yeah. um, that they see that is a slightly different doorway than, um, than some of the other things yeah. that are offered. Well, when you, talk, when you talk about getting rid of the symptoms, then you get caught in the weeds like you're going to cure, right? I think the easiest thing, if the schools and the government could get involved, look, if there's parity pay, and it's truly par parity pay, then if you're going out for sports in, in grammar school and you have to get a physical every year, why aren't you getting a, a scan every year so you have a baseline every year in case you have a, a trauma event? And it's just this EEG, here it is. And if something happens, you have something to compare it to. And as the years go on, you can see what the changes are. 
Why why haven't we done that yet? Again, I've been only doing it five years, so my frustrations, I can only imagine you two guys. Luckily, it's getting easier and easier to actually get a recording. And yeah. um, uh, the, uh, the Koreans dry uh, sensor uh, set uh, with their AI uh, scrubbing out of the artifacts and um, high-level analysis um, that, uh, that, that there's, I think, advances um, in analytics that are uh, helpful at this point. And, yeah. Uh, uh, the ability to toss a helmet on and, uh, uh, you know, Evian and I are in the same age range. I'm a few years older than you, actually, but uh, I won't hold it against you for being so young. <laughs> uh, 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 but, the, you know, people in our age range are starting to concern themselves with cognitive impairment and uh, wondering whether they have one kind of dementia or another. And um, uh, uh, being able to put a sensor on your head for a few minutes and having an answer back within a few minutes, um, uh, as, as they have, is really quite impressive. They are no. they're working with the Montreal... Uh, group that does AI uh, 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 as well uh, to, yeah. to, on, on to large data sets now. I think that's a really, really important thing. If I can just unpack that for a second, Pete, because one of the things that I think is holding the field back is a affordable, scalable way for PCPs to do this in their office. And I know people have talked about this for years. I've been following this literally for decades. But I think there are enough ways now to do it, whereby there are companies, whether it's, you know, I love the, David Joffe from Webby or whether it's Emotive or which and I'm sure Webby will eventually get to dry electrodes as well. But I think Emotive is dry electrodes. But a simple device that can quickly be put on and that maybe it's not a full head, but enough to get scanning for, for example, mild cognitive impairment, um, a first pass at even some of the, you know, ADHD scans. And I know that there's a debate about a full head for the personalization that we discussed earlier, but I think that the field is being held back by not having a few winners of devices that can be used on scale. And I know that's happened with HRV. You know, when I invited yeah. Dick, to a, Dick Gewirtz to a conference in 2010 and he talked about HRV and all the psychiatrists in the room were saying, yeah, fMRI, you get the hot spots, that's the future. And of course, look what's happened. Dick was everything he said, but took, you know, 10 years later, HRV is scaled. And a lot of it is just simply the devices are available, the PPG signals kind of getting more and more accurate. Um, because of the, the clarity of those, the cleverness of those sensors. And then, of course, the, the analysis. We work with a group, um, Travis Wild, who's, we did five years of machine language. So we get updates on our HRV every six seconds. It's like outperforms an Apple Watch and, and Fitbit by an order of magnitude in terms of continuous HRV. It's all available, but it just requires a few examples that can scale and make this easy to do in a couple of minutes and done on scale so you we get databases that can yeah. start pushing them through ai and expert systems so i think that's a big hold back pete is not having a cheap couple of cheap options for scalable eegs in a pcp's office and and in many practitioners offices that are cheap because i think neurofeedback price is still a bit of a challenge in my view and get yeah. real home devices that people can use under guidance. Like um, I know a lot of groups are working on that, but I think that's that pro that cost benefit issue is still not in the mega scale range. Um, and that's a problem. Well, you're saying parity is there, but they, they don't pay the insurance companies don't pay. If you are a uh, if you are not licensed, if you're not a, a, a medical practitioner, insurance just won't pay. And the medical practitioners, if you're a talk therapist, it's easier to make money with talk therapy. And there's no end game to talk therapy. You can have that go forever. Why do I want to have an end game? You know, it's a mental health. So it's kind of, I, I know we're getting there, and I hear you guys saying, Pete, be be patient, but. There's a lot of no, I say don't be patient. I say be <laughs> be impatient. Just, just, just yeah. get, but let's do it. Um, yeah. So I, I now am delighted to say I work for a talk therapy company called Sondermind, who now owns our database. 
and they do a marvelous job and they are open to, I'm sure in the fullness of time, very, very good companies like Sondermont who scale, know how to scale, yeah. um, which they've scaled talk therapy through telehealth. So they're very disciplined. They're very organized. They're very, very good at scaling. They're now, you know, in 16 states, they'll be in all states, I'm sure, within a, a year or two. And so you get these organizations and they're open to other options. I'd be very surprised in the fullness of time where groups, I hope it's on demand, but groups like on demand, if not them, and I think it could be them, would be would have therapists who are trained. And so there is that all that credentialing and the reimbursement becomes more 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 standard but you start off with with start off, if it has to start off with medical because you know we've got to start off with the first steps the fact that yeah. after all these years biofeedback is is i mean the companies i work with quite a few uh, insurance companies and they explicitly will go out of their way not to fund neurofeedback because the evidence has not been sufficiently clearly marshaled and the control and the overpromising has been just off the charts. And so it's a discipline issue. I come back to my original point. It's just an organizational discipline issue, first and foremost. And then it'll get more, more complex as, it, as we really scale it, but yeah. At, at this point, there are applications uh, where, like ADD, ADHD, uh, we, we have good efficacy in that area. Epilepsy, we actually have very good uh, um, yeah. efficacy there as well. But it isn't that everybody's technique that's doing neurofeedback has had that proof. Um, you can you can buy software now that has uh, very high level uh, analytics uh, that provide feedback, but that particular approach has no validation. So I, I can understand the insurance company's concern when neurofeedback is kind of like saying medication. Yeah. Well, what kind? What kind? hundred uh, percent. Um, so uh, the, you know, a, as you know, uh, suppressing slow oddities and enhancing SMR, uh, sometimes suppressing beta, uh, but th th there are routine things that have very good outcomes um, and, and have reasonably good efficacy literature, but there are 100%. approaches in their feedback that are being used that haven't done the proofs and yep. it's, it's unfortunate. So, so let me give you an example of why I think that the, the, the pathway forward, uh, Pete is there, you know, as an MBA guy. So let me give you, I mean, there are hundreds of examples. I'll, I'll give you one. Take yep. a company like able to, they took CBT, they worked out an eight week program and they found the cost benefit in a predictable way for insurance companies. And then United health took them and scaled them. And good luck to them because they did the work. They said, okay, we can't just go CBT willy-nilly. We're going to have, well, I think it's eight weeks. They have a coach and a, and, a, and, a, and a PCP originally, but they tightened it up. So they presented a package, you know, money talks, and they showed that you're going to save money. You're going to get better outcomes, and you're going to have a defined cost that is going to be acceptable to pay is because compared to just open-ended CBT, which could go on, who knows how it's controlled, they tightened it. And that's all it is. It just was discipline of thinking and of playing the game in terms of where it's at, which is money wins. And so show the cost benefit. The whole field has moved in a good direction, which is it's no longer pay for service. It's pay for outcomes. We've got the outcomes. Harvest it. Harness it get it through the system. Yeah. Not everybody's going to win initially. The disciplined people will win initially, but they'll carry everybody else with them. Not a lot to do. <laughs> you know, uh, if you're looking for cost savings, neurofeedback for intractable epilepsy is a gigantic cost savings above Absolutely. and beyond brain surgery, which is the only other real alternative. By the time they've tried various combinations of three different anticonvulsants and, and they're not helping you, you're classified as intractable. And that's a third, uh, perhaps 40% uh, of, of epileptics are not served by medicine. And uh, um, at that point, they talk about uh, uh, smaller lumps being taken out, but they cut out pieces of your brain and that's expensive. 
Yep. Your children's are not cheap uh, operations. No, no, no. But even another example, Jay, just to give that epilepsy example, which is a good one because people understand it, the epilepsy costs. Medication for epilepsy over years doesn't lose a bit of its efficacy. Now, if you combine medication with neurofeedback and you increase those spindle fibers and, and you do, you know, you 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 start getting a an, a minimum dose because you're using alternatives such as neurofeedback, the longer term cost. Now, the people who have showed me some of this are the actuaries who work at these big players. So it's again discipline of neurofeedback in epilepsy presented cogently in a level-headed, not overstated way about where the cost benefit is, such as for um, long-term medication control uh, and also self-efficacy, just to help people see that they can train themselves and, and, and get better. And then, of course, the, the, the intractable epilepsy stories are just incredibly expensive. Um, that's it's not, it, there's yeah. nothing complicated about this, Pete. Yeah. It's just simply the, the examples are there. The people who can do it just need to be put in the front line. And as I say, I'm not kidding when I say, um, get, if you, I'm, I'm hoping that you've had Henry Harbin on your podcast. Have, Have we? You? Get him back. Uh, we, we haven't had him, but we need to get oh him. Oh, my God. Yeah. Get him. And you'll see. Get Henry. Yeah. Get a, people like Jay. And and tighten it up, and I will. I know, just I'm just a little tadpole on the side of this, but we will offer any of our evidence that can help harvest that case. And I'm sure um, other the big databases, the New York database people, I'm sure would do the same. Uh, there's no reason for them not to. Even the Russian databases, uh, Jay. Uh, well, uh, Yuri Yuri is more of a scientist than a businessman, so I'm sure uh, getting data. But some of his stuff, what replicates, it. and then he's doing slightly different neurofeedback. Is that right? A slower cortical potential kind of stuff. Is that correct, Jay? Uh, well, that's the European approach. Uh, they've been doing it that way for a long time. But Yuri's lab has done uh, a beta training and SMR training and yeah. suppressed training and other things. Pull out the, well. Yuri's so. a sensible guy. Just pull yeah. out this. And why, what, right. what's the downside? Let's look at what works. Combine yeah. it, send it to Henry. He'll know what to do with it. And the Korean database is brand new, but uh, they're, uh, and they're well capitalized. Um, uh, so I, I Dave, don't know Dave how Burkis much. Dave Burkis is a great guy, yep. Uh, they're uh, they're 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 busy uh, at this point integrating themselves in uh, to the U.S. market, and uh, that uh, it's been uh, uh, quite uh, quite the climb to get an AI-based uh, uh, cloud-based uh, service uh, approved through the FDA at 510K. Um, you know, uh, 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 but they, you know, they did the hard work and, and went through 510K for their uh, the, yeah. their amp amplifier and, and, set for the head and the database and all and, that. And I think I think David is is the is the is the kind of the overseer of the New York database these days. I could be wrong. Leslie, I think, is still around. These people, these people, you know, they know where the bodies are buried. They they can yeah. they can help they can they can help they can help cherry pick the pieces yeah. that matter and get it across the line. It's maybe like five people, Jay, that if they got on the same page could pull it off. And, you know, Evian is um, an integrative neuroscientist <laughs> uh, uh, who pulls people in from uh, disparate uh, areas. You, you, uh, your uh, journal basically did some publication of uh, uh, some of my stuff even. So, um uh, it, it, it's important for us to end up integrating and uh, bringing uh, together. And uh, the, the field has been an effective circuit firing squad, yeah. and that's the exact yeah, I think the integration is a good second phase. And because the genetics and EEG are now coming into its own, you know, genetics, Pete, is super reimbursable. So that's another, you know, it's just, it, but the second phase will be integration, but the first phase is bringing the warriors, man. Uh, Evian, it, it, when I go to the doctor's <laughs> office, why am I filling that stupid sheet out? Just take my DNA. Here's, here's my history. You know, That's, you people know, don't want to know. I get it. Genes, genes are not our destiny, but I tell you, Pete, we ignore them. At, we ignore it at our peril. We did a um, 1400 twin study, uh, including with the EGEs and stuff. I mean, I think there's, we've got a lot more publication stuff to go there, but um, 
wow, uh, it's just absolutely mind blowing. The reality is that you know, not our destiny, but let's be cautious yeah. about how we use. It. We can we can but, use it to our advantage. This yeah. is all I'm saying. Well, privacy to the side. I mean, if we did it for the whole population, we could budget mental and physical health because we know what the odds are. We don't need actuaries. But there's this thing called privacy concerns. Ah, whatever. Yeah, no, but was, the data the data's getting strong. And, you know, when things like 23andMe and Map My Genome, we work with Map yeah. My Genome as well. These things are cheap now. You can get your genetics for like 200 bucks. Three, and, two, and, 300 uh, bucks, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's astonishing, actually, to be honest. It's a, it's hard to put that much spit in the tube. <laughs> <laughs> and not, not every one of their CEOs is going to prison. So, you know. Uh, <laughs> you, all right. Uh, <laughs> Jay? You did see what happened with Neuralink, right? They they cleaned up the uh, their operations. They got FDA yeah. approval. Uh, they, it, it took them a while. I mean, um, they they were a bit sloppy with uh, in, infected, uh, uh, removed uh, devices from monkeys that have hepatitis B, <laughs> and uh, uh, just kind of tossed it into a package and shipped it, as opposed to uh, uh, the uh, proper. Uh, uh, proper techniques, and you you know you you can't just ship human specimens and uh, uh, medical uh, contaminated things through UPS. You know, so uh, 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 Evie and I just want to get another rise out of Jay before we let you go. Where do we send our thirty thousand subscribers to learn more about you, Evie? What 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 you are? Uh, I just they can about... just go, I do I do a podcast and I, which I'm going to invite you guys on to and I'm okay. going to and I do a um, a total brain podcast. But there'll be a podcast on the brain from knowing to doing. But I've just started social media, uh, Peter. I never did social media in forty years, basically just, just perfunctory stuff. So I've got friends now I've taken up and just put it out. But I suppose it's the simplest way for people who want info, free information and video stuff on social media is um, just drevangordon.com. I have a, they put up a friend of mine, Colton. Um, put the Colton link Roy, right here. Just, just stick it up. It's a private, it's a personal site and all the info is going to be coming through there. So he tells me anyway, you know, these are all people who do all the work and, and I just take right. the credit and it's a, it's a very good arrangement. Evan Gordon, thank you so much for coming on a Neuro Noodle Podcast. Thank you both Jay. guys, Pete. Great to meet you. And Jay, what can I tell you, man? Jay, great, great call, you. my friend. Great to see you, man. Glad we could hook up, guys. Have a great afternoon or morning or Thanks, evening. Guys. Goodbye. <laughs> the NeuroNoodle Podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you. Like our silver supporter, Mind Media. Get the latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from mindmedia.com. Their semi-dry sensor cap is a wonder to see, and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. Their neurofeedback and QEEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit mindmedia.com 